I'm uh, Bill Herron, uh, born July 16th, 1932, in New York City. Uh, family moved to Astoria and um, in Queens. And at the uh, age of five, I entered public school five uh, off Hoyt Avenue and Titmoss Avenue, uh, near the L. And uh, it was at the Astoria Park and Astoria Pool that uh, my father introduced me to the game of uh, baseball. Uh, and uh, by way of uh, growing up, and in a way to keep a close connection with his son, my father would take me to the uh, sunny side yards of the Pennsylvania Railroad near uh, Sunshine Biscuits. And uh, that uh, piqued my interest in travel, trains, uh, geography. What part of Brooklyn was this that you were born in, Bill? It was uh, in Manhattan. Oh, you were not born Brooklyn. in Manhattan? Ah. And uh, was baptized at the uh, Lady of Perpetual Help. Only, uh, and I, when I traveled for treatments at Sloan Kettering, uh, I, we passed that, ah. that church. Yes. But um, another thing, in 1936, the uh, Triborough Bridge was uh, completed. And as another diversion, uh, my father would walk me a good part across the Triborough Bridge. Um, and among other things uh, we did together, he would take me to uh, the firehouse in Long Island City where he was friendly with the lieutenant. So these were all field trips and um, quite enjoyable. Uh, we left Astoria and moved to uh, Middle Village, Queens. Where before, you, before you talk about Middle Village, Queens, 1932, you're a Depression baby. You're a Roosevelt baby. Um, do you have any memories associated with living in the city and the Depression that you can share with us? Well, we lived in Astoria. We lived in uh, an apartment building, five stories. The uh, landlord's son, uh, was a teenager and was heavily involved in the CCC, which later spurred his interest in the Boy Scouts. That's the Civilian Conservation Corps right. for those. And uh, yeah. to this day, this fellow is still alive. He lives in Jersey, retired as an executive of uh, in, the, in, the, in the scouting. But uh, in that building, there were people who uh, were of different cultural uh, heritage. The first floor was an Italian family, and I learned about Caruso and opera. On the second story was uh, a German lady who had a cat she called Pinkola. And as you walk through the building, you would smell the food and the uh, yes. odors. Very pleasant. Uh, the owner of the building was uh, uh, the matriarch of the Maduna family, uh, Mrs. Tachek. And uh, her son was a salesman for uh, uh, Palm Olive, Colgate Palm Olive Pete. So Czech was spoken in the house, in this building, and German and Italian. Uh, so you were introduced to ethnic foods by their aroma even before you were by their taste. And I learned about cut glass and lace and, and the Czech heritage. And uh, it was a very interesting experience growing up. Uh, as I look back uh, in answer to the, the question about uh, a depression, mm. I never really felt deprived uh, of anything. Uh, and perhaps that was due to the fact that there's so many other young people around me. Yeah. There wasn't any competition mm. about who had the best bike uh -huh. or who traveled to a certain location. Everyone seemed to be in the same boat. Uh, the, um, we then left uh, Astoria 
and moved to Middle Village, Queens. And uh, it was at that time that uh, almost the beginning of World War II. And we lived in Middle Village, Queens with a, a family. We shared a, a, a rental home with a family from Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, a, a widow, her daughter, and her son. And her son uh, graduated from uh, Bay Ridge High School, or Fort Hamilton, mm -hmm. enlisted in the Navy. And he served on uh, an oiler, an oil tanker, mm -hmm. that supplied the fleet. And that ship was named the Laramie. He wasn't too satisfied with um, that duty. And on leave, visiting Little Village and his mother and sister, he had an interest in baseball. And he left me uh, caricatures of uh, uniforms players wore in the major leagues at that time, American mm. League and National League, mm. in color. He also gave me a box of trolley coupon transfers. And in those days, almost every street in Brooklyn had a trolley line. That's right. And um, so he left, and uh, we corresponded as much as we could. And uh, then he, uh, we learned that he had, uh, uh, he was assigned to a PT boat, a PT squadron, in the South Pacific, and that's where he lost his life. Oh. The um, I remember the um, officers, the naval officers, coming to the house one day with a telegram, and uh, we had a a funeral mass at the Church of Ascension in Rigo Park, and um, the dear lady, never, we never saw a body. We, were, we had placed in the window at the time uh, to indicate that there was a Gold Star mother living at, the, at this residence. Um, the, and during that time, uh, uh, people lived on uh, coupons. Uh, I remember my father having a gas gasoline coupon that had to be affixed to the windshield of the car, uh, which limited the amount of uh, fuel you could purchase. Everything was rationed. Meats, sugar, uh, rubber, People would were encouraged to grow in their backyards if they had one uh, a victory garden. Victory garden yeah. They uh, we would uh, go on uh, paper drives, uh, cans, so the things could be recycled and used in the war effort. Uh, fats were collected in cans after cooking and brought to the local butcher. These would be picked up and uh, be used to uh, make armaments and uh, weaponry and so on. Uh, you remember the end of the war? Do you remember the... the uh, yes, VJ Day. VJ Day? August 1945. Mm. Uh, it... Uh, I had the sense, uh, never before, or, or maybe since, uh, the sense of, of community and neighborly cohesion. Uh, there was never really any backbiting. There was always concern if there were uh, people serving in the military at the time and were known to members of the family. Uh, the youngsters were encouraged to, to write. I remember writing to a fellow who served on an aircraft carrier. And uh, going to school, uh, Every, every window, every pane in yes. the windows in the school were covered with tape. Uh, it was not opaque. You could see sun, uh, sunlight right. light coming through uh, the windows. Uh, we would have uh, fire drills, air raid drills. Uh, we lived in close proximity to uh, the school, three or four or five blocks away. 
and teachers would walk us to our homes, or at least to an intersection closest to our home, and we would return home during this drill. Mm. Uh, this was uh, a very interesting and emotional experience. Uh, my father was not of age to have served, but... Um, Meaning he was too young or too old? He was, uh, he was too old at the time for the draft. And uh, uh, well, back to the Depression for one second, mm -hmm. I remember that uh, my father's income was uh, $37 uh, a week. Uh, he worked at uh, Farmcrest, which was later Drake Bakeries in Long, Long Island City, which was later bought by the Borden Company. And uh, my father retired from the Borden, Borden Company in uh, 1969. Mm -hmm. The um, the other uh, while at uh, while growing up and uh, in the uh, in transferring schools, I still maintained my interest in baseball. And uh, while living in Middle Village. Uh, I was, and I, I later attended Grover Cleveland High School in Ridgewood, ah. where I was uh, uh, tried out and made the varsity baseball team uh, as a sophomore. And uh, I remember we were playing, we used to play at Farmers Oval in Glendale. And that was a Queens Alliance uh, team, the Ridgewood Farmers, and then there were the uh, 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 medical pipemen, the Greenwall Jewelers. These were fellas uh, uh, 18, 19, 20 or older, and they would have double headers on Sunday and pass the hat for a quarter, 50 cents. And uh, but uh, baseball was a neighborhood experience in those days, it was not the commercial business that it, it was. Uh, it was spring, summer, early fall baseball, winter, uh, fall. Winter football, winter, spring, basketball, no other sports were involved. Right. And uh, I remember listening to, the, there was no television in the early 40s. And uh, I remember I would listen to uh, the ball games that were transmitted by Western Union. I would keep uh, a school book and keep score. So I learned, uh, and uh, it created uh, images in my mind about uh, locations of cities, distances, uh, by being able to compute batting averages and earn run averages. I, I learned an appreciation for mathematics and numbers. The, um, we then, uh, the family moved uh, from uh, Middle Village uh, after I had only spent the sophomore year at Grover Cleveland, we moved to uh, uh, Merrick in Nassau County, oh. and uh, I transferred to uh, Methem High School in North Belmore. I see. And uh, I knew only one person who had lived with us in Little Village whose family had moved ahead of us about a year. No one else in the school. And uh, almost everybody had come from Brooklyn originally or, or the city. The um, interesting part about it was that uh, uh, I, the guidance counselor there had trouble placing me in a social studies class because in the city schools we had civics, we had government, we had uh, uh, American history one and two, we had uh, European history, and by the time I got to Methem and sat and the counselor sat with my transcript, he didn't know what social studies class to put me in. <laughs> So he took me upstairs to the second floor where most of the classrooms were in social studies, and I had to uh, answer questions to each teacher along the hallway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they finally decided that they really couldn't find a class uh, for me to be placed in, so uh, they made me an offer. <laughs> they said, would you mind sitting in Mr. Mr. Schneider's freshman class? I didn't know any, maybe I didn't know how to say no. Right. But Mr. Schneider was an interesting fellow. 
he took me aside and he said, um, I want you to sit in the last row, last seat. You can observe, you can participate, I will call on you unless you let me know that you're ready. What a blessing, I thought. But uh, some of the better teachers I, I, I remember uh, were at uh, Grover Cleveland. Right, right. And um, I remember a time at Cleveland when <clears throat> apparently there was some kind of a dispute or, or strike or the students were going out on strike. And uh, they did the same thing at Maybury Newtown and I think at Forest Hills. I, I forget the, the cause or mm -hmm. why. But I remember in homeroom, the homeroom teacher's name was Jack Levitz. He had to be six foot three, and his shoulders just barely touched the door jams. And he said to the class, if anybody wants to leave, go right ahead. And he stood in the doorway. Six foot four, 200 pounds, and I'm I'm 16 year old wimp, and, but uh, when I I transferred to Methuen in, in it was uh, in the fall. I'm sorry, it was in the spring, and I hadn't completed my sophomore year at Cleveland, and so I had to finish my time at Cleveland because the uh, accommodations uh, weren't ready or something. So I had to leave uh, the house in Merrick. I took the Long Island Railroad to Jamaica Station, took a, a trolley car, a street car, on Jamaica Avenue to Metropolitan, along Metropolitan to Himrod Street in Ridgewood, so I could finish my term at Grover Cleveland. And I did that from September, I'm sorry, it was, it was the, the fall, and I had perfect attendance. Uh, and the, the more I think about it, uh, I, I must have had a guardian angel. Because one of the things I remember growing up was that uh, before I got involved in any activity, out of school or in school, I always had the feeling that there was something on each shoulder. Mm. Either it was a, a, the church, the thought of the church, mm -hmm. my family, mm -hmm. schools, teachers. Uh, I remember my uh, grandfather once saying to me, uh, and this was when I was very young and he was still alive, but he passed away, I think, in 1938. But he said to me, your father's job is to earn money to support this family. Your mother's job is to maintain the house and prepare meals. And your job is not to disgrace the Heron name. So wherever I went and whatever I did, it was, I was always, there was always someone on my shoulder. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, can I can I interrupt to ask you about that family, and who is with you now? That not this was not your family, but now you have a family of your own, and you are living here close by. And you're going to tell us about that and who's with you now. My uh, my mother's maiden name was Velibo, which is uh, Czech, and uh, my father's uh, heritage was German. Uh, my brother has done a lot of uh, uh, genealogical work. Mm. My brother is uh, six years younger than I am. He was born in 1938. And uh, he's traced the family uh, back to uh, 17th uh, century. And uh, he was kind enough to send me all kinds of printouts and mm. uh, verification and that sort of thing, which I have at home. Um, um, it is just the, the only family we have is uh, is was my uh, is my brother today. But I I did have uh, 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 uncles who are deceased. Did you speak any other language beside English as you were growing up? 
I had I had an understanding of German and Czech. Uh huh. And, to hear uh, it spoken. To hear it spoken, right. uh, so that if people would, uh, in those days, people would talk in a different language if they wanted to say something that they didn't want you to hear. But we picked up on that. And uh, I remember my uh, junior and senior year at Lethem, I was in advanced German, and we uh, would uh, have a pen pal. My pen pal happened to come from uh, Karlsruhe in Baden in Germany. And um, she wrote to me in English, and I wrote to her in German. And it was up to either one of us to make right. corrections. And I said, "What? A, this is a wonderful experience. And the, the German teacher we had at the time, uh, Frau Fröhlich, would uh, tell us uh, stories about swimming uh, nude in the Alps, in the Swiss Alps, and how <laughs> wonderful that sort of life was. And... The, uh, to appreciate the environment, mm. and um, uh, now you were talking. I asked you about the languages spoken, and you mentioned your brother is the only family. But at home, who is at home right now with you? Uh, it's just my wife and myself. Your wife, and your wife's name is is Betty. Betty okay, Betty. And, How did you and uh, Betty meet? Uh, I was. To, uh, going to college, uh, I was taking cold summers and working winters at uh, Jones Beach. And uh, in my senior year at college, uh, I was just about a month away from graduation, and uh, my other toll, toll keeper, uh, toll keepers were saying to me, uh, uh, when are you graduating, what is your degree, and what are your plans? And I said, I have a BBA in marketing. And they looked at each other and smiled and laughed and said, oh, you're going to take the Long Island Railroad with the New York Times into the big city. And I didn't know what their point was. And I said, well, is, is, is there something I should know? And they, they pointed to the beauty of the sun and the warm weather. Mm -hmm. And they said, wouldn't you like to do this every summer? And I'm thinking to myself, well, how can I do that and work? And I said, well, what do you fellows do? We teach. Ah. And at that time, in 1957, there was a program called the ITTP, the Intensive Teacher Training Program. And it was sponsored by Lupuls. And at that time, almost every school district on the island was hiring teachers. And the people at New Paul's would take a person with any degree, regardless of major, and you would take uh, courses for provisional certification, take nine credits a summer. And at the conclusion of the third summer, you would be permanently certified. So I first started, uh, uh, I, this is where I met Betty Lou at, uh, at New Paul's. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, we uh, we had to take some courses at the State University at Farmingdale, and uh, uh, the faculty would be sent from New Paltz to Farmingdale. And one of my fellow toll-taker colleagues, fraternity brother, had a Volkswagen. And uh, we would, uh, if you know the... Uh, configuration of the front of uh, the State University of Farmingdale, coming from parking lots on either side is a very wide sidewalk. And we would take breaks for lunch, and uh, Duffy, the Volkswagen owner, and I and Betty would uh, take lunch breaks. And to be sure that we weren't late for class, we would get into the Volkswagen and Duffy would drive us along the pedestrian walk right to the front door of the State University. So that's where I met Betty and uh, I think as I said at uh, my retirement function, the uh, two smartest things I ever did in my life was to uh, enter this uh, noble pr profession yeah. and uh, marry a teacher. Wonderful. Wonderful. And you have any children? No. You have Betty, uh, Betty uh, taught uh, kindergarten for 34 years. Uh -huh. Did She didn't teach in the Brentwood School District, did she? 
she started in Syosset, mm -hmm. and uh, when the Heckscher, I'm sorry, the Sancta Coast Parkway was uh, finally completed, the trip from East Islip uh, to the Northern State Parkway to Syosset became a hassle, and uh, it was of concern to me because uh, of the distance and travel and PTA and all that sort of thing. At the time, I started in North Babylon in 1957. I taught uh, fifth and sixth grade and uh, remedial reading during the summer. And uh, I served as uh, a building representative and uh, treasurer and later vice president of the uh, North Babylon Teachers Association. Let me let me stop you there and ask you to go back a little bit. Do you remember your first paying job, the first job you ever received any remuneration for? Yes. It was during uh, the Second World War. Uh, I uh, worked delivering uh, for uh, a butcher. And I did that after school. And uh, he paid me 25 cents. I worked from uh, 3.30 until about uh, 5, 5.30 delivering um, uh, the chopped meat and that sort of things that, that were available anyway to uh, neighbors in the mm -hmm. surrounding community. It was okay. 25 cents that he paid me. He was an important man in the, in the neighborhood. Uh, yes, and it was interesting too because he would always get strange telephone calls. And he would always talk numbers. And he would say, yeah, uh, how about the 8th? And weeks went on and on and on, and I didn't realize that uh, his hobby was, uh, he loved to gamble. <laughs> he would place his bets over the phone, and... Uh, was there, was there a, uh, a favorite family holiday, Bill, that you enjoyed growing up? My father used to take us to Bayville. Mm. Uh, that was a big treat. And, uh, and there was a time when I was in the Boy Scouts that uh, we were able to go to uh, Ten Mile River near Narrowsburg, New York, for two weeks. And, uh, oh, the other thoughts about depression. I remember uh, insurance men coming to the apartment building and my mother giving them uh, each per uh, 25 cents to keep active the life insurance policies. That was also uh, a time when uh, doctors would make house calls almost regularly. Uh, a different world. Yes. Um, From the one that we know today, at any rate. While, uh, while I was uh, going to school uh, in, in PS 49, 8th grade, ninth grade at Cleveland, we also got involved with a team uh, in Ridgewood, and we were the Fresh Pond Boys Club. And um, in those days, uh, Grover Cleveland had uh, an outstanding soccer team, because most of the people in Ridgewood came from Austria or Hungary or Germany, and that's when soccer was really a, a very important uh, aspect in sports life for those people. But anyway... Uh, we played a traveling uh, league. We had no home field. We won the traveling division championship, and we played the finals, the Queens Nassau League finals, at Arctic Oval in Glendale. And we played uh, Joe Austin Celtics. And uh, uh, the center fielder on that team uh, was Mario Cuomo. And I kept... Uh, scorecards and uh, line scores from all the newspapers from my high school days and college. And uh, I had this one from the, uh, the Long Island Review Star of the Daily Press. It was 1946. I had the box score, I had the write-up, and I sent it to the governor. And he uh, sent me a, a return letter and he said, we always hit lefties like Bobby Wright very well. Uh, and, of course, we lost the game. Uh, uh, Joe Wilson Celtics, uh, uh, an outstanding team. And uh, 
Mar uh, he signed it, uh, Life Has Been Good to Us, hasn't it? Mario. Ah, nice and, story. Uh, I want to ask you what your uh, several questions. Um, as a very young man, favorite toys. Another question, what were your favorite subjects in school and your least favorite subjects? Uh, favorite toys, uh, erector sets, uh, and, uh, I really, I was involved always with baseball, and we played baseball from the time, uh, it stopped snowing until the time yes. it started snowing, yes. and, uh, do you still have your glove? Uh, not the original not glove, the original. but I remember going to a sporting goods store on Woodhaven Boulevard with my mother one day, and as far as, as far as a birthday present, present, she wanted to buy me a glove. And so we went into the sporting goods store, and I uh, took a glove, put it on my left hand, because I threw right hand. Sure. And my mother said, no, I'm not going to buy you that glove. It's not the right fit. She wanted me to put a glove on my right hand, yeah. but I said, Mom, I don't throw left-handed. And this went on for about five minutes. And then finally, the store uh, person said, uh, said to my mother, yes, you're doing the right thing by letting him choose the glove because he seems to know what he wants. And um, baseball has always been a part of my life. Uh, I was fortunate enough in my uh, senior year at nothing to make uh, the Nassau County All Scholastic team. Mm. As a result, I had tryouts. I had a tryout at Ebbets Field with the Brooklyn Dodgers, mm. uh, and two other tryouts with the Phillies and the Cubs. I'm still waiting for the telephone calls. Did you play in college? As well? I played. I played in college. I played uh, at uh, at Hofstra, and I was. Mm. Uh, I was the the fourth outfielder as uh, a freshman. I played my in, in the freshman uh, year. Uh, that's when I had freshman baseball. Uh, I remember one game we played against NYU, uh, and we played it at Hofstra. Uh, I batted fourth. I struck out three times. We're in the bottom of the ninth inning. We had a runner on second base, and I was up. And fortunately, he had a line drive over shortstop, drove in the winning run. And we won the game 14 to 3, and I still have that box score. Oh, but, uh, great. That was I embarrassed. And um, the, uh, I, I, then I, uh, while I was. Explain, why were you embarrassed? Embarrassed. Uh, because I was playing with uh, people from, uh, uh, let's see, Jack Plunkett from Freeport. Uh, Bob uh, Vogel from Mineola, who were all, all scholastic, and playing with them, uh, I, I felt that I let them down, and, uh, and except that I felt so good in that bad about ninth inning when I hit oh, that sure. single. But uh, I felt that uh, when I went to the varsity next year, I was the fourth outfielder, and they had an outstanding team. Uh, won the Met Conference Championship the year before, and I wasn't getting too much playing time as a sophomore. So I decided I had an opportunity to play fast pitch uh, softball at Jones Beach. So I, uh, the official scorer and a public address announcer didn't use my name. I used an assumed name. Uh, one day I happened to go, one night I happened to go two for three in a game, won a game. My name appeared. Uh, he was sick. And the person who took his place didn't know my name. So he asked, and somebody told him, Bill Heron. <laughs> Bill Heron's name appears in the newspaper the next day, and I go into the hospital locker room to get dressed for a doubleheader against Queens College, and I never saw a man so angry and irate in my life. And Jack Smith said to me, you give me your uniform, take your glove and your shoes, and leave. Oh. You could have forfeited every game that you ever played in for us. That was the end of my career at Hofstra. Wow, wow. But while at Hofstra, I uh, was also in the ROTC. And uh, the Korean War had broken out, and uh, 
I was in the ROTC for two years, and uh, I had called into the colonel's office one day, and he said to me, I can't understand what you want from this program. Your grades range from an A to an F. I was having trouble academically. Uh, I was in a fraternity. I, I had played baseball, and I just, uh, I guess the school really wasn't a priority. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was in trouble, and uh, I just left the ROTC thinking that I could spend more time uh, applying myself to studies, and uh, they notified the draft board that I had quit the ROTC. That's how smart you are when you're 19 or 20 years old. Uh, so I knew I was going to be, I have to go for a physical, and I knew I was having trouble in school, and I, I said, I, I have to do something to put myself someplace where I can step aside, give myself time to think where this was socially acceptable mm -hmm. to society, to my mm -hmm. family, mm -hmm. to my mother, to my father, mm -hmm. my brother. So I, I went to Freeport and I volunteered for the draft. And um, my parents weren't happy. But uh, and the Korean truce was signed in June of 50. And uh, 53. And uh, so I was inducted and went to the Army in October of 53. Okay, and you did um, how many years active there? Four years active? Uh, two years active two years duty. Active. Uh, two years active duty. Two years active duty, and then later on, uh, seven years in the reserve. I uh, finished basic training at Fort Dix. Uh, uh, they told me that I had, through testing, that I had code aptitude. So uh, they sent me to Intermediate Speed Radio Operator School at Fort Dix, 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. Closer to home, mm -hmm. SA pass, mm -hmm. have a car. What could be better? At the end of the 13 weeks, uh, you were supposed to be able to send and receive 20 words a minute. I was uh, sending 23 words a minute, and I couldn't get off receiving 19. And they were all encoded texts. So if you missed a letter, you couldn't in substitute a letter to make a word because everything was in code. And this went on for two weeks. And they recycled me and five other fellows in the same, with the same problem to the next class. The class I was in was reassigned to Fort Gordon, Georgia, and Fort Bliss, Texas. The class that we were sent back to, it was the first time in two years that they had a, a levy from AFI. Armed Forces Far East. So, I took German in high school. I understood German growing up and Czech. So now I'm going to the Far East at a big disadvantage. Worse, they tag my epaulet as I get on the, uh, the ship at, in Seattle and it says Korea. What a smart thing I did when I was in college, leaving the ROTC. So uh, the government paid uh, for my cruise from Seattle to Yokohama. And fortunately, uh, there was a change in assignment, and they said to me that I would be staying in Japan. So I was reassigned to the 1st Cavalry Division on Hokkaido. Uh, I arrived on Hokkaido in May very close to Memorial Day. And looking out of the back of the two and a half ton truck, I saw snowflakes. And this is May. You'll know that a few years ago, the uh, Winter Olympics were held in Sapporo. What a beautiful city. But in the winter time, I remember we lived in an old Japanese army base and we'd been have to, we lived in Quonset huts. And all the piping on that base was up in the air, nothing in the ground, mm -hmm. which was another clue about winters on Hokkaido. But anyway, I was lucky enough, I, I, I wanted to get away from this as well, and I knew they had a baseball team. And I went to check this out, and uh, sure enough, but the problem was the team was already selected. I had to wait another whole year to do anything with baseball. And I did. But eventually it did. I did. Now, here's, here's my, uh, I, I want to mention this because it's going to affect the rest of our conversation here. 
Um, I want to get us to Brentwood, and I want to get us to talk about some of the other things in the time remaining. So I'm going to I'm going to keep kind of keep you on track at this point, and if you can focus your answers, recognizing that we're limited in the amount of time, we're going to move. We're going to step it up into second and third gear now. Very good. Okay. Uh, I want to I want to know, Bill, when you came to Brentwood and why why Brentwood. Uh, came to Brentwood in 1964. Uh, while I was at North Babylon and active in the teachers' organization, there were uh, openings occurring in guidance. And uh, I went to uh, post for certification. I received the certification. And uh, I applied for a position in North Babylon and took interviews with all the administrators that uh, were involved, mm -hmm. and I knew. I didn't see any problem. Uh, the final choice was made to select a high school math teacher to take the junior high guidance position. The, school, the superintendent and the high school principal in North Babylon were very, very friendly. The math teacher, well, anyway, they found a place for this math teacher in high school in the junior high guidance. Uh, it so happened that my neighbor in East Islip was Jerry Smith, who was director of guidance in yes. Brentwood. Yes. He knew about this situation, and when I didn't get the job in North Babylon, he said, Bill, there are five openings this coming semester. Please apply. So Jerry Smith was your contact? Jerry Smith. Okay. Who interviewed you when you got here? Um, was there an interview? Uh, yes, Tom Hastings. Mm -hmm. And there was a fellow by the name of Lee Stewart. Yes. And uh, I wasn't interviewed by Dr. Hoyt, but uh, uh, as an aside, I can uh, I recall a story about... Uh, uh, the man's, uh, Dr. Hoyt's uh, sensitivity uh, to uh, uh, personalities and people and, and mm -hmm. education. He had a practice of uh, uh, traveling to as many schools as he could throughout the school year. And there is one story that's corroborated. Uh, he was at South Junior High, and he walked into the faculty room, and uh, apparently uh, uh, two of the teachers were business teachers, and one saw Dr. Hoyt approach, come into the room, and in shorthand wrote on a piece of paper, the superintendent just walked into the cafeteria. So Dr. Hoyt is walking around smiling, saying hello to people, knowing all along what these two girls were up to, ladies. And he walked by, looked at the paper, took out a pen, and in shorthand, writes, yes, I love shorthand as well. <laughs> and it was such a nice atmosphere. Well, what were your impressions? That's I was just going to ask you that. What were your impressions of the district when you first, when you first got here? Uh, it's something that I'll, I'll skip ahead and uh, recall admissions counselors saying to me over the years that I was here in guidance. We always come back to Brentwood because our track record, your track record with us shows that your students are so well adjusted socially. Mm. Uh, the variety of, of uh, diversity of culture in Brentwood is, was really a strength yes. to a lot of these people. Absolutely. And in that sense, a kind of a microcosm of the rest of the... And uh, that's right, because when people left Brentwood and traveled elsewhere uh, throughout the United States as far away, there was never any question mm. of uh, the existence uh, and the, the humility you should show for another human being. You were a, you were a counselor from the day from day one. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I that I look back on too, uh, I was at West Junior High, and uh, we usually worked seven through nine, and then recycled seven through nine again. 
This year, that one year, uh, after I was finishing my ninth grade, there was an opening in the high school. Mm -hmm. So I moved to the Sandling building and moved along with the students with the that students. I drew from 7 through yes. 9. So I knew these students from 7 through 12. Okay. And Big advantage. Bill, what, besides the job description, how would you define your own purpose in the work that you did? Uh, it reflected uh, my own experience educationally. Uh, I wasn't too serious about it. Uh, I wasn't as, as good a student as I should have been. I uh, so you could identify thought, with I said a lot to of, myself, yeah. these youngsters can't fool me because yeah. I've been down that yes. road. Yes. Okay. And uh, it was a very good experience. What about uh, the BTA and your professional involvement with the organization? Was there a time when you were active or a time when you were more active than others? When I, when I first came to uh, Brentwood, I, and because of my involvement with uh, North Babylon, I knew of uh, Jack Zuckerman and, uh -huh. uh, uh, please help me, lived, he retired now, lived, there was a president, lived, lived in Kings Park, uh, uh, yes, Nick Cicliano. Nick Cicliano. So I knew Nick and, and uh, Jack, mm -hmm. and uh, they were asking me uh, to, to get involved, and uh, for, for one reason or another, I, I never did, but uh, always uh, supported the organization mm -hmm. as much as I could. Okay. Uh, at a certain point, and we're rushing ahead because I want to make sure we cover some of this, um, you decided that you had had so much fun it was time to, to do something else. Uh, at what point did you decide that it was time to retire? How many years had you had in at that point? At the time I retired, I had 33 years in, in public mm -hmm. education. Uh, there were three reasons uh, that uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I had to, to retire. One, uh, there was an incentive offered uh, at the time yes. at age 57. And in 1989, uh, I was invited uh, to work as uh, an admissions counselor at Dowling. So I had a place to go. The incentive was there. Yes. And uh, I had an experience uh, in my last senior year with a student who didn't graduate. All year long, we went over sequences, courses, courses required for graduation, courses mandated for graduation. Art and science had to be completed. I recycled back to the uh, 10th grade center at the time, and I get a telephone call in the fall saying that uh, I have parents here with a, a young man who went to summer school, but uh, didn't earn a diploma. And we were wondering why. Uh, I went back to the high school and uh, met with the parents and the young man. And uh, But before I did that, I went to the summer school office and saw Marty Efron, and I said, Marty, this young man was given registration forms to register for summer school. I wrote down Three courses, three choices. Marty gave me copies of what I had written and signed, and we saw that one of the courses was crossed out. Marty gave me copies of a biology class, roster, and chemistry class, so that the student could not say to me, that the class was filled and there was no room for me to go into those classes. Uh, I, uh, the guidance director uh, said, uh, well, uh, you know, you, would you like to go to, uh, come back and take one school, uh, one course in the day school in the fall? The student said no. One course at night school, he said no. And Jerry looked at me and said, how about Suffolk Community College? I picked up the phone and I called Kathy Reinauer and uh, she could tell by the urgency in my voice that I had a problem. 
Well, the student had a problem yes. and put me in the middle of it. Yes. So uh, we we said uh, to the parents. Uh, she said, "Well, uh, when I said I'm, I'm with the parents and the student now," and she said to me, uh, "When can they come see me?" And I said, uh, "Right now." She said, "Fine." He went. He took his course. We gave him his diploma because he satisfied the requirement, and I never wanted to go through that again. Okay. Yes. And that that was part of the reason that you said, "I've." I've done it. I've had it. Yeah, it was. Uh, Do you remember what your beginning salary was in Brentwood, first year? My beginning salary in North Babylon was forty-four hundred dollars a year, and I was given a hundred, two hundred dollar bonus because I was a Korean veteran. Okay, that uh, I guess that would be even more relevant. Your beginning salary when you began teaching, yeah. Uh, there are going to be a lot of things that we're going to try to squeeze in here. But what have you been doing since you retired? Talk about that for a minute. Just I I, I spent time uh, at uh, Dowling, and uh, that was a very rewarding experience. And one of the things I wanted to say about that, and I often thought about doing and never did, I wanted to write a letter to Gary Mintz. Mm. I worked for four years. Uh, with students from all over Long Island, New York State, the United States, foreign countries. Mm. And when I sat and talked to students from Long Island and asked them what they thought about their counselor, and they would say to me, I, I, don't, I didn't see one. Here at Brentwood, we have a policy. You see every student in your caseload three times a year. Incidentally, that challenge of change, the movie yes. that was done in 1960s, foreshadowed the changes that would occur in guidance across the country, but they happened here first. This, uh, it was due to the work of two people, Jack Finan and Jerry Smith. Uh, Jack Finan uh, uh, obtained a lot of uh, federal monies and state monies for uh, guidance purposes and uh, research. Um, we had in the Ross Building, I remember, uh, a black tie affair showing a movie that was made here in Brentwood. Uh, that was it. That was Mart Martin Sheen. That's right. And uh, some of our own counts counselors. And it was... Uh, Dr. Helen Smith. Was Helen, there. Helen Smith was here, Millie Singleton, yes. Ed Frank, Tom yes. McDonough. Yes. Uh, and uh, all the others were so instrumental in this. And uh, it, uh, we had people coming to Brentwood to sit in on workshops. The guidance department every Monday would have a workshop from two to four, and each of the counselors was asked to make a presentation on a particular area of interest. Uh, dropouts. Uh, Periodically, Bill Brentwood right. has become the focus for the whole country, and they, they've all come to learn from us. Yes. We, many things have happened here first, both good and bad. We had the incident in East Junior, but that, that was one of the terrible things that foreshadowed what would happen later on. Then there was the Maslow-Toffler experience, mm -hmm. which you uh, had said that you wanted to talk. Um, you, did you want to mention something briefly about that? The, the, I really enjoyed the, the Ma Maslow-Toffler experience. They, they invited us to, uh, that was in the administration building, by the way, mm -hmm. second or third floor. And uh, they invited us to stop by to look at the program. And uh, I, I've since uh, kept and maintained a relationship with uh, Conrad Follinsby. And we exchanged Christmas cards and that sort of thing. And uh, one of the things that really uh, made me nervous about Maslow Toffel was, uh, and I don't know whether this person was, God rest her soul, uh, Little Thompson, but we we're on that third floor. And there was a youngster seated at the window ledge with an open window. And uh, someone was saying, uh, uh, I would feel an awful lot better if you would just move a little bit off that window ledge. And uh, I think it would put all of us at ease if you would kindly do that. And I was my. Now, the other thing that really uh, changed, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, the hard part for me as a counselor to send transcripts and recommendations to colleges was that I didn't have. Uh, a summary of the nature and function and purpose of Maslow Toffler. But I think, uh, John, you must have had something to do with it, or Ken Morse. But people did put together an explanation and a history and a philosophy of Maslow Toffler. And you never had it? Uh, which I included finally. 
Oh, okay. And okay. it really helped. Okay, all right. But that was a very good experience. But it was one of the unique contributions, again, of the district to yes. the students and to the opportunities for staff. A powerful book that you've read, Bill. Oh, boy. Um, or perhaps you can just tell us what you're reading at the present time or, or an important book in your life. I read an awful lot about uh, uh, Billy Graham, an awful lot about uh, things having to do with um, uh, military history, American military history. Oh, okay. Uh, I, in Japan, served with uh, uh, a Japanese POW. A uh, man at that time that I met him was 44 years old. He was a graduate of Purdue. He uh, was drafted into the service. He was captured on uh, Corregidor and wound up three years in Japan working in a copper mine. And I can never remember, never re uh, forget the, we were in an EM club in, in, in on, on base in, in, in Japan on a Friday night having a, a few toddies. And uh, a, a, the post commander came, came in. Now, Pop had been in the service, he had, he had hash marks about years of service in combat, no stripes, one ribbon. The Brigadier General walked up to this table, looked at Pop Eusted, and said, where did you get that soldier? Pop had a few toddies, stood up, rigid, threw a salute and said, April 12th, 1942, Corregidor, sir. And he walked away. But those experiences overseas and different cultures and uh, growing up, and I have never been without going to a school yeah. since I was five years old. Yeah. What are you most proud of? Having done what you've done, having seen what you've seen. What's, what professional accomplishment, perhaps, a uh, better way of saying it, are you most proud of? Well, it wasn't really any of my doing, but I had one student, uh, this is back in 1976, who uh, ranked first in his class, uh, had a 97 average, uh, scored uh, an 800 math, SAT, 720 verbal, and on the achievement tests in physics and chemistry, 800. Uh, his brother went to Harvard, wasn't being given any financial consideration. Uh, I got a telephone call one day from a representative from Harvard saying, I want to see this young man and no one else. Uh, she came to school one day. He happened to be on a field trip. Uh, he came back and she said, would you please have him call me at home? I said, would you please do this uh, lady the courtesy? He did. And... Uh, uh, two, or th two or three days later, a representative from Duke came in, and I always carried a transcript in my pocket. I was so proud of this. Ah, uh, yeah. And I, I, I said to the representative, "Would you care to look at this transcript?" And he said, "Where is this young man?" And I said, "Well, I can call him out of class." That weekend, they flew him to Duke, Raleigh Durham, spent the weekend. Gave him a full Angie Biddle Duke scholarship. Incredible. Great story. Great story. He, uh, he went on to Stanford, uh, has a PhD, and is teaching at Cornell. And who would that be? Kent Horn Bostel. Great story, Phil. There, there are no doubt many things that we have not talked about. Is there something that you want to make sure we get in to this last few minutes that we haven't yet mentioned? There is one. Uh, this, this young man came to uh, uh, the North Junior High as a seventh grader without speaking a word of English. Uh, and Marty Hawkeyes uh, uh, put me in touch with this. Uh, this. This person came seventh grade, eighth grade night. I went to uh, ninth to program the students for, for the high school. Uh, this person would come to me here in the 10th grade and say, why, why can't I take chemistry like the other students? Are you putting me in the right math class? 
uh, he came to me in the, in the junior year and senior year and said, uh, why can't I take uh, trigonometry and calculus together? Uh, this young man drove the people in the science department crazy. Uh, I, I got him. Cornell had a program established by Hispanic engineers for minority students. Uh, this person, uh, it was a summer program. He uh, was ticketed to go to Cornell and accepted into the program. He missed the train connection at Penn Station with the bus connection that Cornell had. This young man takes a greyhound to Cornell, comes back. He goes to Suffolk Community College in the honors program, and he later went to Stony Brook. There were times when his car broke down and he would be on the expressway hitchhiking to Stony Brook. Motivation. Listen, one of the things that we haven't talked about is your bout with cancer. And I don't want to leave the interview without saying how happy we all are that you did as remarkably well as you did in that fight, which you has, have obviously uh, won. But nevertheless, you spend a good amount of your time visiting ologists, as you said before, <laughs> these days. Dermatologists, urologists. Well, that's the yeah. case for all of us at this point uh, in life, I think. The, the golden years, they call them. I, I, uh, in uh, 1957, in the spring, I knew I had a problem. And... Uh, I went to a radiologist and, and oncologist in Bayshore, and uh, they said to me, uh, we're talking about a problem here that uh, is not months. And I said, in, in anticipation of uh, what you've just said to me, I've already made previous arrangements. And they looked at me and they said, where and with whom? I said, uh, Sloan Kettering. Uh, with uh, Dr. and I couldn't think of the, the doctor's last name. I, I knew his first name is Jayton. And the three doctors looked at each other and smiled. Because they knew. Because they knew this man's reputation. Yes. Yes. Uh, Aram Athanasian's son is a neurosurgeon. He networked an interview for me with this uh, surgeon. Uh, my internist went to medical school with this fellow. He called. I saw this man in a week. He told me exactly what was going to happen, how long the operation would take, and pinpointed exactly what he was going to do. And he did this. He had a caricature on an eight and a half and 11 by sheet of paper of the head and neck and said, this is where we're going to go. This is how we're going to do it. And uh, the operation will take an hour and a half. And he gave me all kinds of exercises to do at home. And uh, I saw him regularly to check up. And uh, now I don't go back uh, except mm -hmm. maybe just once a year in my next visit. How long ago was the surgery? This was uh, in 1997 in July. Thank God. And you have been uh, you have been very active ever since then. And oh. now you're active in the retiree organization. Yeah. Bill Hearn, it has been a joy and a pleasure to finally get the opportunity to sit and spend this time uh, reviewing a, a professional life and a personal life as well. And I want to thank you for being with us. Thanks so very much. My pleasure.